don't know, Dr. Harley is a true friend and mentor for, I, I would say, anyone who's gone through the specialty of olaryngology in the last 20 years, particularly if you are African American, you have been, in, Dr. Harley has reached out and touched you and, and helped and gave good advice and, and provided guidance and mentoring and sponsorship and all the things that, that people need in order to be successful in this specialty. Uh, he is a professor in the Department of Olaryngology. He's, his specialty is in pediatric olaryngology. Um, he did medical school at Howard University College of Medicine. He went into the Navy where he spent several years at the National Naval Medical Center. Uh, and that's also where he did his residency program. He did his fellowship program at the Children's National Medical Center in the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Uh, he has a special interest in pediatric infectious diseases. And I believe, Dr. Harley, you have a student society named after you um, at Georgetown. Yeah, I don't know if you can see my pen. Let me just see. Uh, I don't know if I can. It's called the Harley Society, right? That, that's my pen right there. Oh, awesome. Uh, okay. So we'll go ahead and get started. Let's see. It's about 10 after. So again, this is, uh, some of you may have seen these slides before. I've used them uh, several times over the past year. And the title of my lecture is Early African Americans in Otolaryngology. But our story culminated probably in 2020 when our first black president was uh, elected to the American Academy of Otolaryngology and Neck Surgery, who was Dr. Dwayne Taylor. And all of us know Dr. Taylor, and who's uh, kind of a trailblazer in, him, in, in a, of his own right. But our history didn't start with Dr. Taylor and certainly doesn't end there. Our history is actually 250 years in the making. It didn't even start with Dr. Barnes, uh, who we're going to talk about, Harry Barnes, who the society is named, is named after. It didn't start with Dr. Harry Barnes. And by the way, if there are questions or you can't hear me or didn't understand something, uh, I'll check the chat. Let me check the chat. Right. Yeah. Let me just go ahead and uh, congratulate Dr. Woodard, uh, Troy Woodard. I'm not sure if he's on the call tonight. Um, Dr. Troy Woodard has been nominated. He's running for president of the Academy. So the, those elections uh, will be held this spring. So I encourage everybody to go out and vote. And we may have our second Black president uh, if, if we all vote for Dr. Woodard. Okay. Oops. I don't know why this thing is blinking like this. Here we go. Okay. Okay, so, so early black physicians, uh, so we're gonna talk about early black physicians. And then I, what I did, and I probably won't go get, get a chance to go through this whole litany of things here tonight, but I've divided into the early black physicians and then the first generation of black otolaryngologists, later generations, the first two black female otolaryngologists. And there is uh, some debate about that and then some notable black otolaryngologists. The only HBC residency, which I won't have time to get to, and hopefully the Hinton Gladney Award, which I can talk about, or Hinton and Gladney. So it's proud history of African-Americans in otolaryngology and somewhat ignored in the annals of medicine. But this essay kind of touches on the highlights of this history. But as I've said many times, you can't tell our story in an hour, and certainly not in 15 minutes and uh, 45 minutes, but this will touch on some highlights uh, and some of the things that some of you may not have heard and maybe not be as surprised as I was uh, when I found these things out. Uh, these men, and you notice I have men in parentheses because indeed they were all men. And I talk about the reason why I wanted to bring up the first black women to train in otolaryngology is because it was a hundred years after Harry Barnes was board certified in 1927. It was a hundred years before we trained a black woman. And that's an astounding figure. Uh, and that's why, so these were all black men, but certainly it wasn't confined just to otolaryngology. It was medicine in general. Uh, I know in my class in um, medical school, 
we only had about 10% uh, women and now it's over 50%. It's, you know. So, but that's why it says these men preserved against all the odds. And the amazing story I'll tell you about is those who arose from being enslaved. And then the, we have two amazing people uh, that I was gonna talk about. And then the two black women, they're actually more, and I'm still researching this, this history on black women in the language, but who I put here who dare to compete in a, a white male dominated surgical specialty to become the first. Uh, but there were probably two others before them, or we're still researching uh, this, if anybody knows. Uh, and I think those two others came out of the King Drew um, program in LA where uh, Dr. Taylor also trained. But uh, so I'm still researching this and hopefully someday we'll get it written down. So this lecture tells the story of African-Americans in laryngology. Again, much of this history is not written down or is preserved as oral history or seen in places, found in places that, that which where you wouldn't usually look. And some of the history is lost and we actually may not ever know the full history. And, and I say that because when I get to these first two people, you'll see what I mean when I say we, the history is lost and we may not ever know the full history. Uh, again, just kind of get a, get a little <laughs> uh, poetic here to quote Shakespeare, the slings and arrows of outrageous for, fortune. But yet these people uh, uh, were determined, they were dedicated, and then they had drive. And you'll see that in our early people. So I said, there are rows of people but with determination and these early people, I mean, they had that. So uh, again, the unsung heroes that I'm gonna talk about and the amazing pioneers, uh, which left a legacy that endures until this day and, and continues to endure. So first to talk about early African-Americans in medicine, and not just Olaryngology, but medicine. And I, I put Dr. James Durham, who also is sometimes uh, pronounced Durham. It's, I've seen two different spellings and I need to put an asterisk. I was intend, intend to put an asterisk beside his name and I'll tell you why in a bit. Anyway, he was born into slavery. He was enslaved uh, eventually. And I'll, I'll go through his history a little bit later. So I don't want to belabor that at this point. Uh, so 1783, a slave died in the 1800s. <clears throat> so James McEwen Smith was the first black African-American doctor to receive a medical degree in this country. However, he did not receive this degree in this country. He went to Scotland. He could not be accepted in the American medical school. There, were no, there was no Howard or Meharry in 1837. Uh, so he went to Scotland, came back in, uh, to practice medicine in the mid 1800s. David Jones Peck was actually the first black physician to earn a degree in this medical degree in this country. And then of course, Re Rebecca Lee Crumpler was the first black woman. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. Uh, just talk about some early African-American doctors. And I'll tell you why I chose to put these early doctors here. And this is the reason. Early physicians thought specialization was impossible. Some even saw it as a foolish attempt. Now, this was 150 years ago, but let me tell you about 100 days ago, you know, this concept, the impossible concept. So I had a, a young lady, medical student, who is interested in otolaryngology. She's from the South in medical school. And she wanted to be, originally wanted to be primary care or family practice or something like that. And she got, and so in doing my, just talking to her, well, how'd you get, why did you get interested in laryngology? Well, she said, I didn't think I could be a specialist. So you have, even here in the 21st century, we have black students who think specialization is not for them. They've been told, okay, you got to be primary care. You got to be a pediatrician, not you know, a pediatrician, but you got to be a uh, family practice. And of course, we need all those people. We also need specialists. So, but these early physicians thought that specialization was 
impossible or foolish. And uh, the same was with Dr. Harry Barnes, and I'll talk about that when, when I get to that. Uh, but the these early physicians were, they were not just physicians, they were community leaders. And, uh, and some of them were double trained. Many, many of them were double trained, both in ophthalmology and otolaryngology. And I said double trained, by the way. I didn't say double boarded. Uh, a few were double boarded, but not all. But many, many were double trained. Uh, the ones who were double trained oftentimes chose to practice ophthalmology rather than otolaryngology, but they were trained in both. So this is sort of how I, I call it the historical genealogy. So the pre-modern the pre-modern era of African American otolaryngology, and that's where I'm going to discuss the two people who were enslaved, and then the first generation. I focus on the first generation and the second generation. These third and fourth generations, I'm not. I really don't have time, and I'm I'm still researching. It's again some of the information is lost, and you it's kind of word of mouth. Like when I the beginning of the lecture when I talk about oral history. Well, do you know so and so? Do, do you know? Um, there was a, a black ENT in, in Tuscaloosa or uh, in Knoxville. And, uh, and so this history, and even with Dr. Harry Barnes, who we know a lot about, we're still researching his history. So yeah, so, so some of the later doctors, I'm still researching that history. But the first black doctor, so we get back to James Dunham again. But not only was he the first black doctor, I call him, was he the first black otolaryngologist? And I call him a throat doctor and, uh, or a pharyngologist as I call, it. I term the term pharyngologist because that's what he did. But again, this is one of those amazing stories. So a man born as a slave, see, these are the two um, pronunciations or spellings of his name that you'll find. We, we actually don't know when he died, he died in, uh, the early 19th century, but we don't know. It's kind of lost. And that's the other thing, this history, these histories are lost and we need to capture them. But this gentleman never earned a medical degree. He was born into slavery. He was transferred from one owner to the other. And um, I think transferred, by the way, is a euphemism, say he was sold from, but one of his masters was Dr. John Kersley. And that's where he learned compounding uh, to medicines of the throat. And, because, and when Dr. Kersey died, he was sold or transferred to Dr. West. And then he was sold or transferred to Dr. Dove. And he, he finally gained his freedom and opened a practice in New Orleans. But he was restricted to the practice of throat medicine. <laughs> that's why I call him a throat doctor, a pharyngologist, a throatologist. But he only practiced a... Uh, diseases of the throat. But what's amazing about this man, this gentleman, here is a man born into slavery who was basically a pen pal with Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. So you have a pen pal. I mean, so, I mean, that's the stature he arose to out of slavery. Um, so the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune arose of people and he was one such of those. And he eventually left practice in 1802. We don't know uh, much more about that. We don't know what happened. He, we don't know if he died. You know, there was a Fugitive Slave Act that we all know about where even free people could be sold back into slavery. So was he sold back into slavery? Did he die? Was he lynched? As was very common uh, in those days. We don't know. But that history, the history of his final days, is, uh, the history is silent on his final days. But, but I call him, in parentheses, the first otolaryngologist, although never trained, never, never actually went to college. So the you know, formerly enslaved pen pal Benjamin Rush. Um, Benjamin Rush, who was the founder of Dixon College and uh, so-called one of the founding fathers. So you have a former slave who the pen pal with a so-called founding father. Yeah. So the next amazing person I want to speak about is the first black 
ophthalmologist and otolaryngologist. Another person born into slavery, again in Louisiana. <clears throat> so he was born to a slave trader owner named Do uh, John McDonough. John McDonough was involved in the ACS, uh, which was a society that advocated repatriation of Black people to Liberia. So what he did, he, he allowed his slaves to become literate as a way to purchase their freedom and then migrate back to Liberia, uh, not back, he was born in the United States, but uh, migrate to Liberia. And these, this is a quote from McDonough, I would never consent to give freedom to remain on the soil with, with white men, with the white man. So his intent, although it seems honorable, and I'll show you what the outcome of that was, uh, the, to educate his slaves, but it had a racist undertone. It was to educate them to go back or go to Liberia and, and form societies and colonies in Liberia. So, sure, okay. So in preparation for migration to Liberia, uh, Mr. McDonough, slave owner McDonough, sent two of his slaves to Lafayette College in uh, 1841, uh, he became uh, interested in medicine and did an apprenticeship with a Dr. Hugh uh, Abernathy. He became the first black graduate of the Lafayette College. And I think there's a statute on the, on the campus of Lafayette. And uh, after graduating from Lafayette College, he went to New York. He applied to several medical schools. He was, uh, he was rejected. Uh, he met uh, Dr. Rogers, who was a co-founder of New York Eye and Ear Infirmary, which is a part of Mount Sinai uh, met a, a program in New York City. So, and um, his name, uh, again, his, his government name or slave name was David McDonough. McDonough was his slave owner. But Kearney was the person, Dr. Kearney was the person who actually trained him in ophthalmology and otolaryngology. And so he took the, uh, Dr. Kearney says his middle name. Again, he was born into slavery in 1821, but he received a degree uh, posthumously in 2018, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, so under this uh, mentorship, uh, mentorship of Dr. Rogers, he was not enrolled at Columbia because they wouldn't accept him, but he attended classes in Col at Columbia University, but Columbia refused to award him a degree. And so posthumously, you can see this here, this is 2018. He was finally awarded his degree from Columbia University School of Medicine, medical school. And I'll go back to this first slide that I show you. This is from Mount Sinai. This is a uh, 2020, I believe. This is this. I mean, I'm not sure what this picture is supposed to be depict. It's maybe a little bit racist as far as I'm concerned. But I think it's uh, to depict uh, Dr. McDonough here as the first uh, ophthalmologist and otolaryngologist. Now, as you read more about him, he stayed in New York, uh, practiced in New York, but he confined his practice to ophthalmology. But but this. Um, Mount Sinai in New York Eye and Ear considers him the first black ophthalmologist and the laryngologist. So again, stories that you haven't heard before. And so let's go. So those are the two black two first. Now let's go to the the modern or the modern era. That was the pre-modern era. So Dr. Charles Victor Roman born in 1864, studied at Hamilton Collegiate Institute. Again, the first African-American to graduate. You hear this story over and over again, the first of this, the first of that, the first to graduate from uh, Hamilton Collegiate Institute. And uh, he began, he was a teacher in Tennessee. He eventually enrolled, enrolled in uh, Meharry Medical College, who at the time was only in, in his infancy itself. He practiced in Dallas for a while. And he developed this interest in Olenka, uh, basically double ENT as it used to be called in those days. Um, 
and he pursued uh, training. And this is another common theme in some of these early physicians. He didn't, they didn't do formal residencies and fellowships. So a little bit of this, you know, would say it's, it would take a, a short sabbatical or uh, a couple of months here, a couple of months there, finding notable people in the specialty. So he trained some at Chicago Medical School. Uh, it's very common for these early doctors to go to, to England, London, Paris, and Vienna. So he trained some in London at the Royal Ophthalmic Hospital, the Central London Ear, Nose, and Throat Hospital. Came back to Nashville in 1904 and was the founder of the Department of Ophthalmology and Otolaryngology at Meharry Medical College in 1904. And we'll talk about Dr. Roman a little bit more. Uh, but he was double trained again, didn't do a formal rest. So he wasn't double boarded. Like I said, many of these doctors, early doctors were double trained, but not double boarded uh, or not even boarded. I can't find where Dr. Roman was boarded at all, by the way. Uh, so he was a teacher. He actually received a PhD from Fisk, a doctor of, of laws from Wilberforce, which is a church school in Ohio. <clears throat> he was a writer books and scientific articles and also the history of Meharry. He's a founder of the National Medical Association and the fifth president of the NMA and the first editor of the Journal of the National Medical Association. So again, these, these people were not just physicians, practicing doctors. They were involved in their community. And you see some of the other things he was involved in. Uh, the lay church Many of these people were very religious, uh, involved with their churches. You'll see the same thing uh, with Dr. Barnes when I get there. Uh, vice president of a bank in, in Nashville. He was called the Renaissance man uh, when he died in 1934. Physician, scholar, educator, churchman, writer, business, businessman, and civic leader. So it's Dr. Charles Victor Roman, and we'll talk about him again in the future. I mean, later on in this lecture. So Dr. William Harry Barnes, who this society is named after, the William Harry Barnes Medical Society. He was the first African-American to be board certified in otolaryngology, but also the first in any specialty. Of course, otolaryngology and ophthalmology were combined in those days. And they were among the first, they might be the first specialty to have boards, but certainly among the early specialties to have boards. And Dr. Harry, William Harry Barnes was the first black man to, to receive such a distinction. Again, born in 1887 in uh, Philadelphia, graduated from Central High School, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, matriculated at University of Pennsylvania. And as we speak, the university, and I gave this talk in part to at Penn during the academy meeting last September. Uh, and within the last two weeks, I, got some email from Penn to the people of the Oberlin College at Penn. They want to honor Dr. Barnes, give him an appropriate honor, which has not, at this point, it really has not been recognized as being an, an alumni, alumnus of, of Penn. But anyway, he was the first African-American to be awarded a scholarship. He graduated from Penn in, in 1912. And after his uh, internship, he was an assistant Langosa at the Frederick, Frederick Douglass Hospital. And again, like Dr. Um, Rowan, he practiced general medicine for a while. But these are some of the speeches. Family man, pioneer, trailblazer, physician, inventor, innovator, medical leader, civic leader, church lay leader, community organizer. So again, the same theme uh, that we see here. Uh, and these are some of his traits. So workahol workaholic, early riser, Punctuality, the surgery began at seven. Uh, he was there, you know, you know, the axiom, come early, stay late. You know, he was there, he was always punctual, he was a family man. And we'll go through some of these traits. Ambitious, he, he desired to be a physician from early age, uh, but he was derided by his friends and even his parents. So we heard this before, well, I talked about this a few slides before, African Americans were discouraged from being specialists. You know, boy, stop dreaming. You know, or even even 
discouraged from actually going to medical. I mean, I have friends who are doctors today who were told that they couldn't be doctors. You know, I mean, this is saying this has been going on for long. So in this case, uh, his parents said, boy, stop dreaming, go out and get a job. I mean, basically that's, that was it, you know, go out there and drive a bus or, you know, do construction, do something uh, with your hands, but he persisted. He graduated from Central High, which and I'll talk about that in a minute, which is a magnet uh, high school. And some of these uh, we've already mentioned here, and this is just a sort of a timeline, but this is Central High found in 1836. I don't know if anybody here is from Philadelphia, but apparently it's the second oldest continuous high school in the country and founded as a university uh, magnet school, a prep school. And so probably how he ended up at Penn uh, going through this prep school. Uh, uh, again, like other black doctors, he practiced general medicine, but had more ambition. Again, the same theme. So he went to Paris and he studied in Paris uh, with a couple of physicians uh, uh, in Paris and uh, yeah, in Bordeaux, University of Bordeaux as well. And then Unger, Dr. Unger in New York. And so this is how he he, perfect, he perfected his craft by going, going around the, the world basically to the leaders of, of the day. Uh, and also came back to the United States right there in Philadelphia with Chevalier Jackson. We all know Dr. Jackson. Um, when I was a resident, we actually took the Jackson course at Temple. But anyway, he, Dr. Jackson was the founder of bronchoesophagology, at least the leader, not the founder. But uh, Dr. Barnes actually uh, studied under Dr. Jackson, became the first African-American to, to master bronchoesophagology. And just, just looking for the, the top people in this field to perfect his craft. Again, board certified May 16, 1927. Talked about that. Uh, and then this is sort of a timeline. We've, we've covered some of this. Uh, and then, so before he got his boards, he, he limited his practice to otolaryngology. And then um, he actually founded the Department of Bronchoscopy at Mercy Douglas Hospital. Yeah, here, right here in 1930. Uh, it was also interesting, he was a lecturer, he was a visiting lecturer at Howard. So he would travel back and forth to Washington, here in Washington, encourage, encourage uh, other black physicians at Howard and in DC, uh, he taught otolaryngology and bronch bronchoscopy, encouraged them to seek board certification. Uh, some of his membership, the reason why I put this up, if you look at his, his bio, and, and these are the memberships he was involved in. So the American Medical Association, the National Medical, Philadelphia Medical Society, the Philadelphia County Medical Society Committee on Constitution of Hearing, but it also has him listed as the first black member of the American Laryngological Association. However, he wasn't. And we determined that my friend Dana Thompson, our friend Dana Thompson here was actually the first. And she herself is an amazing person. And some of my other lectures, I don't have time tonight to, to get in all of her, her first. But anyway, Dr. Dana Thompson was the first ALA member. And so I don't know if Dr. Barnes was ever a member of ALA. So that's a part of history that's a written history that's incorrect. But he was a man with eminent surgical skills. He was an accomplished tonsil surgeon. Uh, once said to perform 17 tonsillectomies in three hours using a bloodless technique. I wish I knew what that was, especially back in those days. Um, Although the bobe was invented in the 1920s, so maybe he used the bobe. Uh, but anyway, his, his, his reputation was widely recognized, even to the point where the esteemed W.E. Du Bois, uh, who was in New York, traveled to Philadelphia to have her. And this is the actually, and you can find this online. I found this online. So W.E. Du Bois traveled to uh, Philadelphia, 1931, I believe it is. Uh, they have his tonsils out, and here's a receipt for $100 uh, for, for the surgery. But that's how widely known he was and how, how widely, highly regarded he was that uh, the famous orator and civil rights leader, W.E.D. Boys, would travel from his home. And he actually helped, uh, this is another letter, uh, how Dr. Barnes actually helped W.E.D. Boys in some of his 
efforts. Uh, he was an inventor, the, the Miles lingual tonsillectomy, which I'm still trying to find. <laughs> I've gone online, I've tried to find that. I wish I could, because it's one of my least favorite operations is a lingual tonsillectomy. <laughs> If I could find a better way, a better way to do it, I would. Then maybe this. And we are, by the way, we are in contact with his family. Uh, I had mentioned that Penn is reaching out to try to honor him, and we're doing that through his family. We we located. I don't know if anybody's on the line who helped me uh, with this location. We've located a grandson who, uh, and so to maybe fill in some of the, the holes in the history and maybe even I don't know if they're drawings or anything. Uh but these these things that he invented, um, I don't know if he has patents on them. I couldn't find them on I, I've searched online. I didn't do a patent search, but I searched online for I can't find examples of what what this is. But anyway, um uh developed a technique for a peritonsal abscess. I'm, I'm not sure how it was done before his technique. Uh Miriam got me in incision we think you know okay Miriam, yeah, okay you just make a little radio incision and you know you pop a tube in so but apparently maybe in in the early 20th century this wasn't such a simple idea so anyway he devised a, a, a new way to do it in a hypoposcope for doing pituitary surgery these are all his inventions just some of them i shouldn't say all of them and also a record keeping system he devised Again, he was the president of the National Medical Association, the 37th president, and the president of the Philadelphia Academy of Medicine, and he was a national lecturer. Um, but he sought to elevate the status of black doctors. So what was happening in medicine, I'm sorry, in, in society, was also happening in medicine. So here's the picket line, uh, black patients, and even myself, and I talk about, I was telling some of my residents last week. I was actually born in a segregated hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. And they let you were born in a segregated, yeah, I was born in a segregated, it's called Brewster Hospital, which is now a national landmark. But so this was happening back in his day, Dr. Barnes's day. So patients, if you're black, you're either in a segregated hospital. If they didn't have a segregated hospital, you were in the basement. So, so Dr. Barnes sought to elevate the status of black people, black patients, black doctors. And uh, here is a uh, most most black physicians trained at black hospitals. And here is one uh, one of such black hospitals, uh, Omar uh, G. Phillips in in um, St. Louis, Freedman's Hospital in D.C., Providence Hospital in Baltimore. These are um, places where if you, you, so you had 50 internships, but you had twice as many doctors. So there were no, there wasn't places. I mean, it's, it's not unlike what we're seeing today, by the way, in Northern God, you've got uh, more applicants than spaces. But anyway, back then, there was just limited opportunity. Most black doctors could not practice in white hospitals. They couldn't do residencies or, or internships. And so when they got one, they became general practitioners. GPs, I mean, what we call today, I guess you would call it a family practice, but but simply if you got, if you were lucky enough to get an internship, you do a year, I think sometimes you can do two years, then you go hang up your shingle. Uh, you're just a, a country GP and uh, that was a, the thing of the day. But he sought to break down racism, forces of racism. And so he formed this thing called Society for Promotion of Negro Specialists in Medicine. And uh, what he did is he, is he chose prominent people of the day, Dr. Chester Chin, who actually, I have a slide on him, but I don't have time to go into it, but he was a graduate, and I believe he was the first graduate of the University of Michigan, uh, uh, Black, uh, that might not be true, but he was a graduate of the University of Michigan. And he was boarded in ophthalmology and also uh, boarded uh, in, in, in otolaryngology, as I uh, said, many of these people were double boarded. But he was the first to be inducted in the American College of Surgeons. And also Joseph Dyer here at Howard University. And the Dyer Award, there's, a, there's an award named after him, the Joseph F. Dyer Award, which the Harry Barnes Society uh, 
traditionally has awarded uh, a plaque to the best presentation by a medical student or a resident. So the Joseph F. Dyer Award named after one of its early tradition. But anyway, I don't have a lot of time to, to go into the, the premises of this uh, society, but basically to elevate the black physicians or Negro physicians as they were called in those days. And so they would be accepted at non-Negro and non-segregated hospital, which we've accomplished finally, but back then it was not, it was, it was not certain that you could actually you could train. You. And by the way, the only place you could train, there were only two places black doctors could train by and large, and that was Howard and Meharry. In another talk, I talk about the first black doctor did not, we're talking doctors now, we're not talking about laryngologists. The first black doctor in the, the South did not graduate a, a black doctor until 1948 after World War II. And that was the University of Arkansas. So back in the 1930s, if you didn't train at Howard or Meharry, you couldn't be a black doctor. Uh, there was no opportunity for you by and large. And, and even up until not too long ago, most black physicians were training at those two hospitals. And now we have more and now actually uh, there's more opportunity at, at all across the country. But anyway, so this is kind of just to labor this, not to labor this, but this is what he sought, Doctor. And just to kind of go on for Dr. Barnes, but we run out of time. Um, he had five children, uh, two of which were physicians. One was a mortician, which is interesting. His namesake was a mortician. And uh, I don't know which of these uh, five, the grandson is, a, is the uh, father of the grandson who, who we have contact with and we'll, we'll soon find that out. Deeply religious, very religious. Again, these men were very religious as many, many black people were in the early days, uh, the board of trustees. But what I found interesting, during World War II, he made a pact with the parishioners of this church in Philadelphia that they would pray every day you know, when they're on the battlefield. So they would be joined through this spiritual medium in space and time. His daily prayers, but that's that was him. Um, again, some of his other accomplishments. I'm gonna go on here. Uh, well, baby clinic, uh, he established at his. Oh, he was also a politician, he ran for uh politics as a Republican. And as you know, in 1932, most black people were Republicans, so that's not, I mean, we might say that's an anathema today in this society, but a hundred years ago, most black people were Republicans, so he ran as a Republican, he lost, um, so he never actually entered pol politics. He was the chairman of Eastern Pennsylvania Division for Negro Voters, so again, so he was all, he was civically, he was all over the place, but he was also a renowned physician. He finally died in 1945, just before the end of World War II. He actually suffered a stroke and then a spinal injury. I don't know the mechanism of these, and then died uh, maybe from pneumonia. I have to, have to confirm that, but uh, <clears throat> just before the end of World War II, he passed away. But his legacy lives on. Uh, and as I said, enduring legacy through the Harry Barnes Medical Society, which is what this meeting is about tonight. But I want to go back to Dr. Roman, who I mentioned earlier, who was the chairman at Meharry. So this society was originally known as the Roman Barnes Society. And it was named after, again, Roman, who was the ophthalmologist, double board, I mean, not double board, but double trained ophthalmologist at Meharry. And Dr. Barnes, the first board certified uh, black otolaryngologist. So it's so, these, when ophthalmology and ophthalmology and ENT were, or one, the double ENT, as they call it, uh, they would meet in the same city. And as we do today at our academy meetings, there's uh, for all the, the programs will meet, you know, usually on a Tuesday night, uh, we'll meet, we'll have a little social event. Well, the black people were left out. So they formed their own society, which was the Romans. So they would have uh, a forum to meet and, and, and you know, just exchange, uh, niceties with each other at these yearly meetings. Uh, this Roman Barn Society eventually became a member, a section of the NMA, which it is today. 
so the Romans, so the president, which, which is Troy Woodard now, of the Roman of the Roman Barn Society is also the chair of the NMA, Old Lenargology Section of the NMA. So that's persistent to this day. So finally, um, the specialties uh, broke, disbanded, and we went our own way. And we, the society was named after uh, Dr. Barnes, uh, uh, which we, we maintain until this day. Again, so we talked about Roman. I don't need to talk about it again. Um, again, this is the creed open to anybody um, who completed an accredited residency uh, to meet annually at the at the meeting, which we still do today, and meet annually at the NMA. And uh, Dr. Johnson mentioned that we have a program this summer at the NMA. So this still persists. Uh, this is the, the legacy we have from this. And then when the uh, two academies last met in Las Vegas in 1978, and then uh, we went our separate ways as societies. Uh, again, I don't want to. We do have an endowed lectureship. This was instituted last summer. Uh, so, and Dr. Uh, Johnson knows more about this endowed lectureship. This is this is new as a part of the legacy, the Roman Barnes, uh, the Harry Barnes Medical Society legacy is now having an endowed uh, lectureship. Uh, before time gets away, I want to talk about the Hinton Gladney Award. So these, so Barnes and Roman were in the first generation. Now we get to the second generation. And Two of the prominent there there are several, but two of the prominent people from that generation are now have an award named after them, which is the, the Hinton Gladney Award. So first we'll talk about Dr. Gladney, John Gladney, going to Little Rock, Arkansas. He was actually marched with Martin Luther King. Uh, again, so again, these these doctors were involved in civics. Uh, they were community leaders, helped desegregate schools in St. Louis. He was from uh, Alabama, uh, graduate of Meharry Medical College. Again, interned at the Homer G. Phillips. That was one of the hospitals where the only place you could, you actually could intern in those days. Uh, and then he trained at the uh, Illinois Ioneer. And again, he was a chair, although he was interim. And I believe he was the first black chair in the United States, the interim chair uh, at, university, at St. Louis University. And there's, to this day, there's the John H. Gladney Diversity Award at, at St. Louis at SLU. So Orlando Giles is a pioneer, a civil rights leader, and a mentor for many. And then I want to talk about Dr. Hinton, who was actually my mentor. I mean, I knew Dr. Gladney. I didn't know him as well as others, but I knew Dr. Hinton, who was actually my mentor. Dr. Hinton was a, a graduate at Howard. He taught us uh, Orlando we never actually did a, a rotation on ENT in medical school, but we had lectures, and so that was Dr. Hinton. So, but years later, he reached out to me, and I, and I actually have a letter that I've shown in other lectures that Dr. Hinton just encouraging me. But he was the chief of otolaryngology at Howard, and so when we sought to form an award in about 2000 is when this this Hinton Gladney Award was founded. Uh, the two most prominent living African-American physicians in, in that day, 20 so, so years ago, were these two men. So this award is named, is in the award annually. Uh, in, in a different lecture, I talk about all the awardees. So Dr. Chen, I, I want to go on. I want to talk about the women. First, Sydney Butts, uh, I just want to, Kudos to Dr. Butts, who is the first black woman. And I don't know if she's still, I think she may still be interim, but but she's still the first and needs to be recognized. She's uh, at Downstate, a, a black woman, graduate of Yale, to be the chair in the United States. And then the first women, the first two women, so Lynn Goodlow Green, and there's some debate about this. If you read the literature, I mean, yeah, so there's, a, there's an article out that says Marie Brown Wagner is the first black woman to graduate uh, to be, become an otolaryngologist. But here, I went back and did my research. Dr. Wagner graduated from Einstein in 1981. 
Dr. Goodlow Green graduated in 1980 from Tufts. And here's her, her actual certificate. Oops, there's my timer. Here's her actual certificate. Time is my time is in the time zone. So right now, as it stands, Dr. Lynn Goodlow Green was the first black woman. But I went, I made the point that so Dr. Barnes was board certified in 1927. It was 50 years later before there was a black woman. I mean, that's how outrageous this is. Um, it, it was a first a, a white man specialty, and then it was a, a all men, black and white, and now more and more women. And actually, for the, just to kind of on a personal note, I, I've been in Georgetown for 30 years. It'll be 30 years this year. And for the first time, we've had two black women in our program at the same time. And so, and we're hoping to get a third one with this, this round of uh, 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 resident in four students. So, so, but this is just the, the legacy of our specialty, how it took women a half a century to get where the men were in the early 1920s. So, and these are both friends of mine. Uh, oh, I just want to reach out to Dr. Jim Fortune too. Uh, he, again, these are pioneers. So Fortune, there's a Pacific Coast Oto-Ophthalmologic Society, ECOOS as we call it, is one of the oldest medical societies in the Western United States. Uh, meets uh, every June on the West Coast or Hawaii. Dr. Fortune was the president, the first black friend. Yeah, he was first. We've had a second one since. Uh, Dr. James Fortson, so I want to congratulate him on that. So again, uh, these are the members, uh, not all of these, are many of the members, this picture was taken a few years ago. Uh, you can see Dr. Johnson, our host there, Dr. Johnson. These are the members of the Trio, Triological Society. Uh, but again, we do have women, Dr. Valerie Flannery is also a member, Dr. Dana Thompson is a member of the Triological. But uh, so, this is our story. Our story is still being written. Uh, many will remain unsung, especially if I can't find the, the other black women who I know exist who may have actually trained a little bit earlier. So I think that's, I wanna end it right there so we'll have time for questions. So um, I see uh, something in the chat. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got some more trial fellows. I also wanted to say, Dr. Harley, that was outstanding. Um, this is a really good talk. I think this is the second time I've heard a lot of it. It's, it's really, really good. I'm sorry, I'm the one that's echoing. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, give shout out to Dr. Carrie Francis, who's the current president of the Harry Barnes Society. And then also Dr. Angela Powell, who came up with the idea of starting the endowed lectureship after Dr. Uh, Fordson. Right, yeah, so yeah, I. Uh... Did mention Dr. Pa. I actually had her in, you know, some of my slides. I guess I didn't put it in this slide deck. But yeah, Dr. Johnson also went to uh, Central High. So that's an uh, interesting piece of history. Yeah. So if I got anything wrong about Central High, you can you can correct it. I mean, I'm only I only quoted what I read about it. Let me see anything else in the chat. Um, yeah, the Flexner report. Yeah. Let me talk about the flex report. Let me, I will, I didn't want to get into this, but I will refer everybody to my article that I wrote. Actually, when I received the Hen Gladney Award in 2006, usually we would have a lecture. And my lecture was on black medical schools. It was the uh, history of, of black medical schools in the 19th and 20th century. And in that paper, which is, published in the Journal of National Medical Association, 2006, I think September, I believe. I talk about the Flexner Report. So in 1910, the Flexner Report was, was promulgated. Uh, Flex, Flexner was hired to, to survey every medical school in the United States and Canada. And what he did, and there were many, many, and so the, the gist of my article, there are, the, the number is, is fluctuate is between 12 and 14 black medical schools. Only two survived. That was Howard and Meharry. And so, right, you're right, Flesh. So it was a Fleshner report. And if you look at the report, I've actually read the report. I have a copy. It was it's pretty racist. Uh, why he he saved Howard and Meharry, 
because he basically said, well, black people need some place to go. Uh, and he talked about how many black people are living next to, to millions of black, white. And this is in the report, by the way. So we're right, it's a, it's a, everybody should be aware of the Flexner report, it was, two, it was 1910. So the schools gradually closed. The last one to close was at Shaw University. It was the Leonard Medical School. It's the, it was the most um, successful of all the black of the ones that closed was the Leonard Medical School, uh, which was around 1925 or so. It actually closed, but yeah, thanks for that. Oh, Dr. Hobson is also, yeah, I didn't have a, a, a picture. I just had a picture. <laughs> I need to include those pictures, but uh, thanks for that. Um, so any other comments, questions? Uh, I think I answered the two questions in the chat. So as we say, right. during the election season, go out and vote in this case. <laughs> vote for Dr. Rudy.